Leonardo da Vinci once said, Oysters open completely when the moon is full, and when the crab sees one, it throws a piece of stone or seaweed into it, and the oyster cannot close again so that it serves the crab for meat. Such is the fate of him who opens his mouth too much and thereby puts himself at the mercy of the listener. Beneath the moon's watchful eye, a silent dance of power and subtlety unfolds, echoing da Vinci's timeless caution. Today we venture into the shadows cast by words unspoken and tales untold, where the lines between wisdom and folly blur. Inspired by the 48 laws of power, we explore the delicate art of restraint in speech, where silence can be both a shield and a sword. Join us as we tread softly through history's whispers and the silent battles waged in the hearts of those who sought to wield power. Here, in the realm of the unsaid, we discover that the most profound truths lie not in the words spoken, but in the silence they leave behind. Welcome to the mystery. The strategy, the enigmatic world where sometimes to say less is to hold the world in your palm. Rome stood on the brink, teetering between the glory of its past and the uncertainty of its future. In this precarious moment, a man emerged from the shadows of legend. His name whispered like a secret promise of salvation. Genius Marcius, who would be etched into history as Coriolanus. As the 5th century BC unfurled, he rose as a beacon of hope, his sword carving a path through the enemies of Rome, safeguarding the city's destiny with each battle won. This hero, clad in battle-worn armor, remained an enigma to those within Rome's walls. More a myth whispered in the wind than a man of flesh and blood, his life was a tapestry of battles fought and won, his presence more felt than known. The year 454 BC marked a turning point. Coriolanus, with a reputation that walked like a shadow before him, set his sights on a new conquest, the political arena of Rome. The race for the consulship, a throne of shadows and whispers, beckoned him. Tradition demanded a public address from each candidate, an opportunity to ensnare the hearts of Rome. When Coriolanus took the stage, a shroud of anticipation cloaked the crowd. So with a warrior's pride, he unfurled the tapestry of his valor, dozens of scars, each a silent herald of his dedication, his sacrifice for Rome. Seventeen years of war, woven into his skin like stories in ancient scrolls. As he spoke, his words became a mere backdrop to the visual saga displayed on his body. The crowd, captivated not by his rhetoric, but by the vivid scars, felt their hearts swell with pride and their eyes brim with tears. In those scars, they saw the essence of Rome's spirit. Bravery, sacrifice, and unwavering patriotism. The path to Coriolanus' election seemed not just likely, but predestined, as if the gods themselves had carved it into the stones of Rome. As dawn heralded the arrival of polling day, the streets of Rome were set for a spectacle like no other. Coriolanus, buoyed by the initial adulation he had received, strode into the forum with a boldness that bordered on audacity. Surrounded by the Senate and the patricians, Rome's elite. His entry was not just a show of confidence, but a declaration of his perceived invincibility. This newfound boldness, a stark contrast to the calculated restraint of his earlier days, cast a shadow over the common people. They watched, their brows furrowed in concern, as the man who once stood as a symbol of Rome's might now reveled in unabashed arrogance. Coriolanus, his voice resonating with a confidence that had grown unchecked, addressed the crowd. His words, however, mostly danced around the ears of the wealthy, his allies. There was a brashness in his tone, a departure from the stoic warrior they knew. He boasted of his military feats as if they were the sole pillars upon which Rome stood. His jokes, sour and elitist, found favor only among the patricians, while his opponents were subjected to scorn and derision. The commoners, who had once looked up to him as the embodiment of Rome's valor, now exchanged glances of uncertainty. Whispers began to weave through the crowd, subtle yet persistent like the first hints of a changing wind. As the sun set on Coriolanus's fateful speech, whispers of his arrogance fluttered through the streets of Rome like leaves in the wind. The common people, once mere spectators, now surged forward as a formidable force, their numbers swelling at the polling stations. United in a resolve that echoed through the marble corridors of power, they cast their votes, a chorus of silent defiance against the man they once admired. Coriolanus, defeated not in battle but in the very heart of Rome, retreated to the familiar solace of the battlefield. 
his heart seething with a bitterness that tainted his once noble spirit. Weeks passed and Rome, gripped by a famine that clenched its jaws around the city, found itself gasping for relief. The once bustling market stood forlorn, the cries of vendors replaced by the hollow echoes of need. In this dire hour, a large shipment of grain, like a lifeline thrown into the turbulent seas of despair, arrived at the gates of Rome. The city, its heart beating with a mix of desperation and hope, buzzed with the news of this crucial delivery. The Senate, poised to distribute this bounty freely among the people, found their plans on the verge of fruition. In those crucial moments as Rome teetered on the brink of salvation, a dramatic shift unfurled within the walls of the Senate. Coriolanus, his heart now a cauldron of vengeance and spite, stood firm, his words cutting through the air like a blade. With a resolve hardened by his desire for retribution, he staunchly opposed the distribution of the grain. His voice, once a herald of victories, now rang with a cold determination to halt the lifeline that the shipment represented. This pivotal stance, fueled by a vendetta against those he believed had wronged him, sent ripples through the Senate. The fate of the grain, and with it the fate of Rome's starving populace, hung precariously in the balance, swayed by the vengeful spirit of a hero-turned-adversary. His rhetoric, persuasive and potent, began to sway some within the Senate, casting a shadow of doubt over the impending vote. But Coriolanus did not halt his tirade at the mere distribution of grain. He launched into a scathing critique of democracy itself, challenging the very foundations upon which Rome stood. His proposal to strip the common people of their tribunes and to place the reins of the city solely in the hands of the patricians struck at the heart of Roman governance. The Senate Chamber, once a place of debate and decision, became a battlefield of ideologies. The words of Coriolanus, echoing off the ancient walls, left a lingering question in the air. A question of power, of the future of Rome, and of the delicate balance between the will of the many and the rule of the few. As Coriolanus's defiant words reverberated through Rome, they ignited a firestorm of fury in the hearts of its people. His speech, a spark in a tinderbox of resentment, left one resounding message ringing in the ears of every Roman. Coriolanus, once their hero, now stood as a threat that must be stopped at all costs. The tribunes, armed with the resolve of the populace, marched to the Senate, their demand echoing like a battle cry. Coriolanus must be brought before the people he had so brazenly scorned, yet Coriolanus, entrenched in his defiance, refused their call. His refusal was like a gust that fanned the flames higher, and Rome found itself engulfed in riots. The streets, once veins of commerce and life, now pulsed with the fury of its citizens. Sensing the mounting wrath, a tempest of unrest and indignation, the Senate convened under the weight of a crucial decision. In the charged air of the chamber, Amidst the palpable tension, votes were cast, a chorus of assent that echoed the people's will. With each vote, the scales tipped further towards resolution. The tribunes, those guardians of the people's will, found solace in this decision. But the people's thirst for justice remained unquenched. They clamoured for Coriolanus, demanding not just his presence but his contrition. A promise of silence from him could restore his path to the battlefield. When Coriolanus stood before the people once more, a hush descended. Every eye was fixed upon him, every ear straining to catch the words of the man who had once been their hero. His speech began as a trickle, soft and slow, but it swiftly swelled into a torrent of blunt force. Insults sharp as arrows flew from his lips. His tone dripping with arrogance, his expression etched with disdain, was a slap to the faces of those who had once lifted him on their shoulders. But Rome was no longer a city to be cowed. The more Coriolanus spoke, the more the anger in the crowd swelled like a tide rising to meet an unyielding cliff. Their patience, worn thin as parchment finally tore, a chorus of outrage drowned his words, a tidal wave of voices that swept away his arrogance. In that defining moment, Coriolanus, the once great hero of Rome, was silenced not by the enemy on the battlefield, but by the very people he had vowed to protect. This crescendo of public fury reverberated through the city, reaching the shadowed halls where Rome's fate was often decided. Here, the tribunes, voices of the people, gathered in solemn council. In the wake of the people's roar, their verdict, heavy with the burden of justice, fell upon Coriolanus like a guillotine's blade. Condemned to death, to be taken forthwith to the precipice of the Tarpian rock and cast into the abyss, the crowd, upon hearing this, erupted in a chorus of approval. 
there to light as palpable as the Roman sun. Yet, in the intricate dance of power and privilege, the patricians, those stewards of ancient lineage, intervened. With whispered arguments and the weight of their influence, they swayed the course of fate, the sentence, as stark as it was, transformed, from death to a lifelong exile. Coriolanus, the once great military hero of Rome, was to be banished, never to tread upon its storied streets again. When this news unfurled like a banner across Rome, the city burst into unprecedented celebration. The streets, which had once echoed with the march of soldiers, now resounded with jubilation. The air was thick with the laughter and cheers of its citizens. Not even the euphoria following the defeat of a foreign enemy had seen such revelry. It was as if Rome itself had been reborn, its people liberated from the shadow of a hero who had turned into a spectre of discord. In the city's heart, joy reigned supreme, marking the end of an era and the beginning of a new chapter in the annals of the Eternal City. Before he ventured into the political arena, Coriolanus was a name that resonated with awe throughout Rome. His feats on the battlefield painted him as a paragon of bravery, a man around whom legends effortlessly wove themselves given the citizen's scant knowledge of his personal life. Yet, the moment he stepped into the public eye and voiced his thoughts, the shroud of grandeur and enigma dissipated, his words more akin to the braggadocio of a rank-and-file soldier than a revered hero, revealed a different man. He hurled insults and slander, betraying a sense of threat and insecurity. Suddenly, the Coriolanus that the people had envisioned crumbled before their eyes. The stark contrast between the hero of legend and the man who now stood before them was a bitter pill to swallow. With every word he uttered, Coriolanus diminished his own stature. His inability to harness his words was a glaring sign of a deeper lack of self-control, diminishing the respect he once commanded. Silence would have shielded him, kept the populace from glimpsing his true sentiments. He could have maintained his mystique, likely securing the consulship and advancing his goals against democracy. But alas, the human tongue is a treacherous creature, restless and wild, ever eager to leap from its confines. Unchecked, it can wreak havoc, turning potential triumphs into ruins. In Coriolanus's case, his unbridled words were his undoing a testament to the adage that power eludes those who squander their wealth of words. Power often plays out as a theatre of appearances, where saying less than necessary enhances your perceived stature and influence. Your silence, a strategic void, unsettles others. People, by their very nature, seek to interpret and understand. They yearn to grasp your thoughts. By meticulously managing your disclosures, you create an enigma they cannot unravel. Your concise responses and deliberate pauses place them in an uneasy spot, compelling them to fill the quiet with their own chatter. This involuntary spillage of words often lays bare their vulnerabilities and hidden motives. In these interactions, they may feel outmaneuvered, as if something essential has been slyly taken from them. Haunted by the encounter, they'll ruminate over your sparse words, attributing to them greater weight and significance. This heightened scrutiny of your limited utterances paradoxically magnifies your presence in their minds. Thus, your power is bolstered not by the abundance of your words, but by the echo of your silences. The principle of saying less than necessary transcends the realms of kings and statesmen, permeating various aspects of life. By speaking sparingly, you cloak yourself in an aura of profundity and mystery. Andy Warhol, the iconic artist, discovered early that persuasion often falters through excessive dialogue. People in their obstinacy might rebel against your words. Warhol once confided, I learned that you actually have more power when you shut up. In his career, this approach bore fruit. His interviews were enigmatic, his responses vague, leaving interviewers grappling for meaning in his elusive phrases. Warhol seldom elaborated on his art, allowing others to weave their interpretations a tactic he admired in Marcel Duchamp, another artist who understood the value of silence. Duchamp's reticence made his work a subject of endless discourse, enhancing its value. In the year 1825, Nicholas I rose to the imperial throne of Russia, his reign commencing amidst tumultuous times. Almost immediately, the nation was engulfed in a rebellion sparked by liberals demanding modernization to align with the industrial and civic advancements of Europe. This uprising, known as the Decembrist Uprising, was met with ruthless suppression by Nicholas I, leading to the sentencing of one of its key figures, Kondraty Rylaev, to death. On the destined day, 
Riley Ev stood upon the gallows, the noose a grim adornment around his neck. As the trapdoor swung open and he plunged, an unexpected twist of fate occurred. The rope snapped, sending him crashing to the ground. In that era, such occurrences were often viewed as divine intervention, and typically, a reprieve from death was granted in these circumstances. Rising to his feet, battered yet alive, Riley Ev, perhaps in a mix of relief and scorn, exclaimed to the onlookers, you see. In Russia, they don't know how to do anything properly, not even how to make rope. This remark was hastily conveyed to Nicholas I at the Winter Palace. The Tsar, initially inclined to pardon Ryleyev in light of the extraordinary event, paused to inquire if Ryleyev had said anything post his providential escape. On learning of Riley's sarcastic comment, Nicholas I's momentary mercy dissipated. In that case, let us prove the contrary. He declared ripping the pardon to shreds. The following day, Ryleyev was taken to the gallows once more, and this time the rope held fast. While silence is a potent tool, its indiscriminate use can sometimes backfire. In certain scenarios, not speaking or offering minimal information can breed suspicion or even unease, particularly among those in positions of authority. Ambiguous or sparse remarks can lead to interpretations far removed from your intentions. Therefore, the art of saying less must be wielded with discernment, tailored to the situation at hand. There are moments when it's advisable to adopt the guise of the court jester. The jester, under the veil of his playful banter and seemingly innocuous chatter, often possesses a sharper intellect than the king he serves. He engages in endless talk, entertaining those around him, skillfully masking his true acumen. In the eyes of the court, he is but a simple fool, his wisdom hidden beneath layers of jest and joviality. Moreover, words can serve as a smokescreen for cunning strategies. By engaging your listener with a steady stream of conversation, you can effectively divert and captivate their attention. The more you speak, the more you can lull them into a sense of complacency, reducing any suspicions they might harbor. Talkative individuals are often perceived as harmless and straightforward, lacking guile. In contrast to the silence often associated with power, this verbosity can be a cloak for deception. By appearing less shrewd and more unassuming than your adversary, you create an advantageous setting for subtle manipulation. This inverse tactic, where speech is employed to project vulnerability rather than strength, can be a cunning means to achieve your ends. Thank you for joining us in today's exploration of silence as a tool of power. If this episode has intrigued you, please like, subscribe, and share. Your engagement fuels our journey through the laws of power. Until next time, remember, wield your words wisely and let silence be your compass.